we believe extremism and terrorism is a threat to regional peace and security, is a threat to the Jordanian national security, and that's why uh, our uh, uh, effort and our determination continues to be uh, the same, and this is the history of this country, and this is the nature of the people of Jordan. The world seemed to be numb at the thought of another ISIS beheading. So the most media-savvy terrorists in history up the ante, hoping to send shockwaves around the world. They did just that. But is Jordan and the rest of the world merely buying into the ISIS narrative, helping them spread their message, and doing not nearly enough to find, stop, and kill them? He was the first director of the Afghanistan-Pakistan Center of Excellence at the United States Central Command, 26 years service as an intelligence officer and Middle East foreign area officer, a close advisor to General David Petraeus in Iraq, now professor at the University of South Florida. Let's get the facts. Let's welcome Derek Harvey to Midpoint. Colonel, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here, Ed. Colonel, let's get right down to that question that I asked just a couple of moments ago. Are we merely buying into their narrative by what we are doing, by the Jordanian reaction, and by the fact that every time something happens, governments get incensed, they get angry, but they don't do anything? Well, we are in some ways doing that, and I don't expect a significant change in our strategy or our resourcing. We're going to continue with a limited commitment, and our leadership will still be rather weak in that area. Uh, Jordan will be bolstered a little bit for a while, and they have limited capabilities, uh, good air force, special operations, and good knowledge of the area. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't anticipate much change from this administration in exerting the leadership and a developing the strategy and executing it that will make a difference. They have had opportunities in the past, and they have not done so. Colonel, we keep hearing that word, and I, I need to ask you this one, leadership. We keep hearing that over and over again. Instead of just being somebody who makes nice speeches, honestly, seriously, Colonel, what is leadership in a case like this? Well, leadership is clearly articulating what it is that is in U.S. interests and in the interests of our, our regional allies and articulating the threat and defining it clearly for the American people and those in the region. And then leadership is making sure that you commit your political capital and your investment of time and attention to executing that strategy that you develop. We have not had that leadership and there's real doubt in the region about U.S. commitment, resourcing, and dedication to this effort. It seems to be that we are focused more on just showing that we're doing something for uh, political purposes at home, a little bit of activity, a little bit of rhetoric, and hope that this crisis also passes. But what's the thing that breaks that logjam, though? Because uh, no disrespect meant, but these are a lot of the same comments that we hear from a number of different people about leadership, showing leadership, doing something, and yet nothing gets done, and yet we continue to sit here and ask the same questions over and over again. The American people, are, I think, are a little bit sick and tired of this at this point, and they want to know, if we're going to get involved, let's get involved. So what's the substantive piece of action that needs to happen right now? Right now that really makes a difference? Well, I think that clearly the president frames this as an argument about going all in with 100,000 or 150,000 and having another invasion of Iraq or, or Syria. But that's just unrealistic and it's not necessary to the task. We do have capabilities to, to address this, declare no-fly zones, no-go zones in Syria actually be committed to arming and working with people that are going to fight ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria, making a clear de determination about the future of Bashar al-Assad. We should not be on the side of someone who's committing atrocities. But the president has a focus on one thing, and that is a nuclear deal with Iran and acknowledging Iranian hegemony in the region. And that is alienating our friends and creating tremendous doubt in the region. Colonel, I only got about 30 seconds left and then we're going to take a break. Do we just need to get to the point where I say, look, enough of this being worried about friends, enough of this worried about shaking hands and all this. If we're going to get involved, let's just do it. We're already being considered pariahs by so much of the world. So if we consider this and we're going to go kill the bad guys, let's just do it. Well, we could go in with strike operations, be more aggressive, a combined joint task force, more airstrikes. We've used limited capability a limited footprint, and we really haven't put our best effort out. Give the military a mission and let them take it on, but give them a clear mission to actually go out and degrade and defeat the enemy. 
Maybe turn them loose is not a bad idea, at least in this case. Colonel, please hold on just a few minutes here because we're going to ask a question. Where are we in the rest of the world heading? Why are we wasting our time in fighting vermin such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS? What do we do? We turn there. We cover plenty more ground with Colonel Derek Harvey right after the break. The ISIS killers have sent a message. What's the response? It's coming up here on Midpoint. comes more solid fact without all the fluff. Retired U.S. Army Colonel and veteran intelligence officer Derek Harvey. Let's get to this statement from the New York Times today in the opinion pages. ISIS is losing in Iraq. That's number one. And number two, American military officials in Iraq say a smaller revamped Iraqi army will be ready to begin big operations to retake Iraq from the Islamic State in the next four to eight months. Two statements there. Your comments. Well, one is ISIS ran up against a wall when it hit the Kurdish-dominated and Shia-dominated zones. But they still have the initiative, and they're conducting a lot of offensive operations along the Kurdish border areas, along Kirkuk, western Baghdad area, and they're fighting very hard north of Baghdad. But they did lose ground in a couple of provinces to the east. Um, so they've run into some trouble there, but it wasn't unexpected. Their campaign has had some attrition, but only tactical effect. They are doing reasonably well, given everything, in Iraq. And importantly, we're going to see it maybe in eight months to a year before the Iraqis are up to the task. In well, the that's meantime, what they're talking about here. They're talking about four to eight months for the Army to be ready. Do you agree with that? I agree. I think it may be longer. But here's the bigger issue. Increasingly, the body regime in Baghdad that replaced Maliki is looking to be a acquiescent in supporting the Shia militia's atrocities led by the Codes Force in Iran against Sunni communities in the areas around Baghdad. And that is not going to bode well for rallying Sunni Arabs to the side of the government or to work with the United States. Two, it looks like we're clearly cozying up to Iran both in Iraq and in Syria. And so that alienates the Sunni Arabs across the region. And it feeds into a narrative that bolsters ISIS. We've talked about leadership here. Now I'm going to ask you about President Obama's nominee for Defense Secretary Ashton Carter. He is now speaking. He's getting his hearings right now. In your opinion, is he the guy to bring leadership? And can he really get anything done while he has the thumb of a president who doesn't seem to want to talk about terrorism on his head at all times? I don't think Ash Carter is going to change the course of the Pentagon. The direction is being set by the national security staff and the president in particular. He has agreed to this position and I believe he's going to be an effective manager, focus on budget, uh, refocusing on rebuilding the military. But any change in policy in these areas is not going to come from the Pentagon. So he might be a good guy, but he's a caretaker. Absolutely right. No real changes in store for us there. So with no real changes in store, we're sitting here in what many people tell us is the beginning of a 10-year war against people like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so many others. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, Colonel, but what are we doing here? I mean, this, is, this does seem to be a little ridiculous, and the American people are going to be looking at this going, we need some leadership, and all we have is somebody sitting there signing checks. The rhetoric coming out of the White House, going back to the summer, going back to the speech in September 10th, and elsewhere has not matched the reality on the ground and you know it's been obfuscation by the administration clearly the people in the region see this president and the administration as cozying up to Iran and also cozying up to likes of the Muslim Brotherhood who those in the region see as a terrorist organization and also Hamas we are alienating friends in Egypt we are alienating friends in the Gulf in Riyadh and also in Turkey. It is not going to work. Colonel, are we just reaching a point where, again, if we look down the road a couple of years, you're going to find people in the Middle East and those who are basically watching right now and laughing, that they're going to laugh even harder at us and go, you know, the Americans, they're just so incredibly stupid. They just don't get it. And they've shown us again, they just don't care. I mean, is that well, where I we're heading? Well, I, I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction within the U.S. military and the Department of Defense and elsewhere about the failings of this presidency, the unwillingness to call a threat a threat and define it for what it is, to be clear about U.S. interests. 
and to develop a strategy and listen to the advisors, whether it was you know, Secretary Gates, Secretary Panetta, General David Petraeus at CIA, Hillary Clinton. He has not listened. He has an ideological framework that is inconsistent with American interests in the region. Are we going to get to a point where when a new president is elected in 2016 that we're going to be so deep down this rabbit hole that it's going to take us generations to get out of and not just a couple of years? Well, I hope not. And I think, you know, there are plenty of opportunities and I think there's a lot of pressure being brought to bear. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see a fundamental shift. We're going to continue to muddle through over the next two years. Colonel, that's pretty depressing for the American people. Not only that, for the American military, isn't it? It is. It's disheartening. I talk to soldiers, airmen, Marines all the time. I talk to people in the intelligence community, and they are disheartened by the course that we've taken and the losses that we have squandered over these last couple of years. Remember, it was very clear ISIS was reemerging as a threat. The director of DIA laid it out very clearly, as did you know, members of the State Department. Those cautions were not heeded in the White mm -hmm. House. And that's part of the problem. Unfortunately, we are all out of time. Colonel Derek Harvey, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I'll look forward to speaking again soon. Thanks, Ed. All right, my pleasure. They're doing much more than just taking our money. China's sitting and waiting. We'll focus there when we come back on Midpoint.